All right, so a number of you have asked uh, for more information about game industry financing, most specifically around budgeting for your studio, how much money is needed, how the, where the money goes, and so forth. Uh, this is a particularly good article on Gamma Sutra by Richard Atlas. He's a regular blogger there. This popped up recently, so uh, it's a perfect thing to look at. It's a great... The ability to be able to project how much money you're spending each month, how that money can change based on internal changes, how long your company can survive with that in place, uh, what in fact an investment might have, what kind of publisher deal you need to have, and so forth, all make a difference. So, the beauty of this is it's not particularly an article as much as it is an actual spreadsheet. And I take it for granted you've all dealt with spreadsheets at some point or another. So he starts with uh, an excellent basic sheet, but uh, what I want to start with is what probably most of you can't see, which is the various other sheets involved. So feel free to come look up here and if you want I'll share the actual link later so you can grab it. So the first page is generally the most important thing. What are your cash flow projections? Do you actually have enough money to survive as a company? So you'll want to put in how much money you actually have in your account, the receivables coming. The wonderful thing about places like getting money from Steam and the App Store is that it's reliable. That money comes in when they promise. Surely you don't know how much it's going to be until it shows up. So you are kind of basing your projections on trends from them. Uh, so you can plug in various numbers and see what comes up, but then the reality might be completely different. It is, however, better than dealing with a publisher where you don't know what you're getting and you don't know when you'll get it. So they do have an advantage there. Some of the major expenses you would have are up here in the B, upcoming expenses, salaries, rent, monthly QA. What's QA? Very good. Bank fees. Monthly SAAS cost. Who knows what SAAS stands for? You all should know this. What is SAS? <laughs> it doesn't stand for SAS. It uh, spells SAS. Spending on no. Good try. Salary. No. Software as a service. Who has an Adobe account or who's paying a monthly fee for any software? Well. That's the, or some of your games, you think. Yeah. <laughs> I did not hear anything that the front row said, but uh, I'm sure that you have it as a gift account and uh, someone uh, else's paying for it. So, SAS is software as a service. So, if you have an Adobe account, you're paying every month or yearly, however you set up, for that software. So, you have to budget that in. Monthly marketing costs, accounting fees outsourcing and work for hire for those of you interested in contract work. Hardware costs tend to be an annual breakdown, miscellaneous office expenses, paper, uh, coffee, uh, donuts, etc. Employee education, a contingency fee, always try to have an extra 10% lying around for any expenses you can't anticipate. Company insurance, that is the insurance you have if things blow up and you need to replace your hardware or if you, somehow a bug gets into your software and infects hundreds of machines. Health insurance, legal fees, yes, even if you're not being sued, you have legal fees. You're paying folks to look at contracts, you're paying them to handle your incorporation, your intellectual property filings, and so on. Audio outsourcing, localization, marketing, PEGI and other ratings, we'll talk about those more. Per project SAS costs, outsourcing or for hire, and those become your per project. And then you have one-offs. For instance, you take a loan, you do a massive renovation, etc. Why would it cost you to get a radio? It, all right, we will talk about this because uh, that is a part of these chapters. So you know what the ESRB is. PEGI is essentially the uh, English equivalent of the ESRB. So you submit your game to be reviewed to get a rating on it. That costs somebody. Somebody has to spend time to do it. Who do you think pays for that? You. Well, your publisher, but somebody involved with releasing it. It's not a free service done by the government or anybody else. The ESRB is handled by the ESA, which is a, we already, we've talked about the ESA before. It's a trade association with the bigger publishers. They have an agreement set up with their members who are paying huge amounts to be parts of that association to review their games, give them ratings. 
If you're not a member, you are paying X amount to do it. So yes, you have to budget for every game in every area where you're going to have a rating. So if you're trying to sell it in a store in China or in, uh, well, let's, let's jump right to it. So they have that here on ratings. Nice breakdown. Peggy, USK, ESRB, GRAC, ACB, OSLC, Ciro, GSRR. Uh, there are some others as well, but these are some of the main ones. So if you want to have your game selling every one of these in the regular stores, in the Walmarts, in every single one of these locations, you are paying each of these rating services to rate your game. And that rating goes on the boxes they then sell in those places. So you have just paid uh, eight different rating fees, and it's not cheap. It is not a $5 application. So that is something that needs to be budgeted in based on what locations you're going to be uh, dealing with. Okay, back to the cash flow projections. Then it breaks down to these numbers. What is your resulting cost per month? And what is your survival projection? How long can your company survive? Yes. Not really. Again, it is primarily based on if you're a member of that association or not. And the big ones are members of that association, so they have their own arrangements in place. But if you as an independent entity submit, you should be paying what everybody else is paying. Uh, on the other hand, within the ESA, your costs to be a part of the ESA are based on your revenue. So theoretically, the bigger ones are paying more to have it because they're paying more for their membership. All right. Salaries, we've talked about that before. Generally, you want to break down... Uh, the base salary of that person for the year, they have uh, ways that you can set in government contribution. There are some places where the governments will pay a certain amount of uh, people's salary. We can even get that here. If you're a new employee, you might get on the job training or be part of an apprenticeship program where the government's paying your salary instead of the company in order to get you training and make you a more hireable individual. If you have a base salary, you'll have potential raise estimated in there. You have the raise salary government contribution, uh, you'll often find benefits put in here too and matching. So if you have retirement thing, the company might match it and therefore they would have to calculate that matching amount into this. And I didn't announce to kill our cell phones at the start of class, did I? So please turn off your cell phones. All right, outsourcing and work for hire. So you'll see a lot of different ones might be a monthly expense. Maybe you have an artist constantly on retainer you're regularly using. Maybe they'll be just on a project. Maybe there'll be a one-off payment. All of those you would incorporate on in here. Rent. And basically, they put all the office expenses in here. Rent, power, internet, cleaning, any associated taxes you have to pay, uh, pay going along with it. If you have your own building, uh, in addition to the mortgage, you might have uh, the mortgage insurance. You might have uh, the uh, insurance on the property in addition to your regular company insurance, something to protect you if someone comes in and breaks their leg, for instance. You might have uh, an F&B expense here for the food you pay. You, you serve your employees along the way. Uh, and uh, it is interesting. You might have various uh, internet connectivity abilities. If, for instance, you have a T1 line coming in, but you also have cable TV, you might have two expenses listed there and so forth. So any infrastructure costs would go in here. Here's the monthly uh, software as a service. Unity and Unreal, not so much the monthly cost, but the rest will really give it to you. This is one that I see bites a lot of... Uh, Small studios haven't thought about it. You get your initial website, and then you realize you need some other websites, and then you are paying for a regular WordPress subscription to that account, and then you're paying for other plugins. And before you know it, this has become a several thousand dollar a year part of your company expenses. Or maybe you even have your own server in house that you're having to maintain, or you're paying for an off site server. Events. Good breakdown of a lot of the different events that you can go to. So, 
your decision if you want to and see what they budget for it. 17500 to go to GDC in 2018. Well, in that case, they probably brought the whole team. You notice that then they have 2018 as a, or 2019 as a cheaper expense of 10000 bringing less people, et cetera. Uh, hotels are these days the big part of that expense, but if you have a booth, that can suddenly ratchet it up accordingly as well. Yeah, you're right. It's uh, It used to be not a bad idea for a developer, for a studio to have a presence at E3, and they've got a side arena for that. But these days, really, for a small studio, unless there's some special sales or marketing function that you have to do, there's not much reason to have a booth there. Being present there is still not a bad idea. And uh, E3 is also run by ESA, if you didn't know that. All right, so some marketing expenses. YouTube ads at the Switch launch for their game. Uh, PR help for PAX East and for their launch. New merchandise. Facebook ads, Instagram ads. Some of these are one-off. Some of these are long-term. You might have a marketing uh, service that you pay. PR, public relations, is separate from marketing. You have, might have one group to handle your marketing and one group to have, handle your PR. And then there are associated costs with those as well. Okay, we talked about the ratings agencies per project SAS costs. Tax credits is an interesting one. You can tell this is a, a European, actually, British group because he spells checking earlier with a Q. But there are more tax credits available overseas for game and software developers. Obviously, we have them in Georgia. So that is something you might need to take into account here. However, budgeting that is an interesting arrangement. That's its own class. Your corporate taxes, how much you have to pay, how much you have to set aside to pay in your corporate taxes. And then projected game sales over time, if they're selling well versus if they're not selling well. Uh, project 2 sales, Project 3, Project Future sales, good ways to project what your sales might be down the line. All right, if you like, I'll go ahead and share this uh, link, but really, I'd rather you go ahead and grab the Ngam Sutra because he has a very good blog, well worth following if this is uh, areas that are of interest to you. And the numbers going in, the amount of money going in, the amount of money going out can be significant. Any questions on the Richard Atlas spreadsheet? All right, then. Let's go ahead and discuss the quiz from last week. I haven't really taken a look at how well you did. A lot of later quizzes on this one. Uh, so let's see how everybody did on working with IP. Let's see. Quick view. All right, not too bad. Not too bad. Let's go through them one by one. According to the textbook, some say that using IP suppresses innovation. True or false? True. And why is that? Makes you make one type of game. Right. There are certain contractual boundaries that are established that you cannot go past. On the other hand, what we've talked about before is that some constraints do inspire creativity. So I kept that in there, but still keep in mind when you are have those kind of constraints, you can't exactly have revolvers and uh, tanks in a uh, Star Wars game, you are forced to think in new ways and come up with interesting ideas. Of course, the fact that you're then limited to everything that's only in the movies is a whole other issue. IP, an idea or collection of ideas that is owned by someone or something and is a result of creative work, stands for intellectual property. What is that opposed to? What's the opposite of intellectual property? Physical property. You've got the property like this monitor, this laptop, this uh, GGDA coffee mug, and the property that's in your head, which has always been an interesting idea that we have property in our head. I've known people with vast expanses of land in their head that seems unoccupied, but we do own our own intellectual property. And this is an important concept to keep in mind for all of you who do end up doing contract work at some point. Your expression of a work is still your ownership, even if you're working in somebody else's world. So if you work for 
um, Ubisoft and they want you to draw them a new assassin, you draw them a new assassin and they never get an assignment of rights from you, you still own that expression of the idea. Now, that's why you'll see things called work for hire or we own all your rights or we own your rights plus everything in your mind forever and ever, uh, which isn't too far from what some of the contracts call for. But if you create something, even in this class, it is yours. Now, if you create something in conjunction with the rest of your team, then it jointly belongs to all of you. And none of you can really do anything with it without the other's approval. Which of the following is not a legitimate reason to use a licensed IP for game development? A, to mitigate risk, B, maximize sales, C, minimize marketing expense, D, the design phase can be skipped, or E, many sales will be based solely on the IP. The design phase should never be skipped. Good. All right, next question. Sequels are always based on existing IP. True. I mean, something had to come before it for you to have a sequel to it. Now, there have been what are called um, moral sequels, or, uh, oh, there's another term for it. I can't believe I'm blanking on it. Spiritual sequels. Thank you very much. So this game is a spiritual sequel to that game. In other words, I don't have any of their intellectual property, but I wouldn't, couldn't have done it if I hadn't played their game first and been so inspired. You don't want to ever say you're ripping them off. You don't want to ever rip them off. You want to pay them a homage. You want to say... Here's what I liked about their game, and here's how I'm doing it better. Here's how they inspired me, not here's how I'm doing exactly what they did. As a game developer, you can choose any existing IP with which to work. True or false? False, false, and then false. And it's so odd. Doing Kickstarter this past month, seeing a number of different people trying to kickstart projects based on intellectual property they had no rights to use. It was just the weirdest thing. These things would pop up on Kickstarter. A million people would suddenly say, you have rights for that. And suddenly Kickstarter would pull the, the, uh, the plug on it. So I, I'm amazed that people don't understand this. And if you have not come up with it, you can't be making money off it. Now, you will see companies looking the other way when you make mods or when you make fanfic based on their games, as long as you aren't necessarily profiting. And sometimes even when you are profiting, this whole thing with Machinima, uh, who is a fan of blue versus red from Halo? Red, red, red versus blue. <laughs> Gray versus fuchsia. Whichever ones they are. Yes. Uh, by uh, Rooster's Crowing Teeth. Um, uh, but they made a significant amount of money off of the Halo game engine. And essentially off of the Halo... IP, but uh, Microsoft and Bungie never really came after them because it supported them so well. Don't count on that. Pardon? So, but the original money was definitely from their direct uh, use of the Halo engine. Uh, let's see. Being a fan of an existing IP qualifies you to develop a game for it. False. And even beyond what they talk about in the book, I found that people who are too deeply vested in a game have a hard time, or in an IP, have a hard time pulling themselves out of it enough to make a good game based on it that's different from what's come before. They're too locked in to what exists and aren't ready to take those constraints and build something new and better. Wikipedia is a safe and reliable source. We could just end it right there. It's a safe and reliable source to use for research of an existing IP. False. <laughs> it's a good starting point. That is very true, and there are still ways to get in there and hack most of them. So yeah, never count. I have dear friends who are involved with the Wikipedia project and have been since it launched. They'll be the first ones to tell you don't rely on it. Uh, if an owner of an IP approaches a developer about creating a game, the most important thing that will happen in the initial meeting is, A, they will give you a bunch of money. Oh, no, A, the designer should ask the right questions to establish constraints. B, the owner should describe to the designer what the game should do. C, the owner should furnish the designer with headshots of any actor or actress associated with the IP. Or D, the owner, sh D, the owner should indicate how much he is willing to pay for the project. Or E, the designer should inform the owner of the IP what the mechanics will be. 
establish constraints. And one of the interesting parts about this, we think about the IP being something the developer or the publisher pays for. Someone owns Harry Potter, uh, Lord of the Rings, Star Wars, so the developer or the publisher will have to pay for it. There are people with IP who want it turned into games who no one's going to pay them for their IP. They have to pay developers to do that. So it's not a bad idea to sometimes take advantage of that. For instance, here in town, uh, Auto Trader is a very significant group that put, put on a magazine, has a website for people buying cars. They have an Auto Trader game that they paid someone else to develop. Basically, their pseudo IP, someone else developed the game based on it, and they paid them to do it. That's generally considered advert gaming, but not always. Gaming is advertisement. Uh, if the owner of an IP, sh the owner of an IP should not have any input to the features the game will have. True or false? False. false. If the owner, if the owner has some of the best insights, you'll learn quickly where to listen to them and when not to. When working with a licensed IP, it is not relevant to know if any other games have been developed based on it. False. Definitely know what came before. There are how many ratings established by the ESRB for video games? All right, who wants to try naming them other than RP? All right, first of all, what is RP? Okay. Rating pending. What are the others? Uh, uh, all the way back. Uh, early childhood, E for everyone, uh, E, uh, e uh, E10+, uh, T for teen, M for mature, and AO for adults all <laughs> Very good. Adults, if you're 18, you're not an It is up to the store. The ESRB is not law. It is something that the stores are supposed to follow. And if the store chooses to ignore the law, that's upon the store. But then parents do have recourse if they want to claim that that game hurt their child in some way. Same with movies and the like. These are guidelines for the theaters and the places that rent movies and so forth. It is not backed by the force of law. All right, uh, where were we? While the exact core or message of an existing IP is not always perfectly translatable to the core of a game, it is the de designer's job to match them as close as possible. True or false? If you want to not have a million upset fans coming after you with torches and pitchforks, it's absolutely true. And some of those fans are probably amongst here in this class. A sequel always refers to a new, standalone product. True or false? Yeah, there have been a lot of uh, sequels that have been add-ons to existing products. When working on a sequel, what happened in the previous game is of little significance. True or false? false. Of course, don't feel yourself too tied to it if you have a great idea. Exploring players' reviews and reactions to a game are an important part of developing the sequel. I'm not hearing everybody jump in on this one. What do you think? What's the general thinking? Yes, okay, and back. You seem to be, oh, true, okay. Yes, yes, it is true. Now, however, just like on QA, what you take from that input is up to you. And a good developer learns to analyze what's valuable feedback and what isn't. Again, when people say they don't see enough of this character, what does that mean? Or they see too much of, the, of that character, what does it mean? When uh, I'm sorry, exploring play. Uh, sorry, the chance. Now we go to snakes and ladders. The chances of a snakes and ladders game to take more than a couple of hundred moves is essentially zero. Very very low. Shoots and ladders is the United States version of snakes and ladders. True or false? True. We talked about it before. That is a game to teach the ideas of uh, <laughs> of uh, karma and. Uh, Religious determinism. <laughs> it is possible to mathematically evaluate a race to the end game. True or false? True. And finally, what is the central city in Planescape? Uh, Sigil. Sigil. Absolutely. Okay, very good. So that's the quiz. Judging by a quick look at it, you all did pretty well with it. So let's start discussing the chapters of the book. Chapters 9 and 10 on IP. Let me get some more light in here to wake us all up. So, the, uh, one of the authors of the book, Brenda Brathwaite, has worked on a number of different intellectual properties. She started off with the Wizardry game, which was an existing game line, before she started working on it, one of the earliest 
uh, fantasy role-playing games. But she, and so she's worked on very specific game-focused IP, but she's also worked on very broad, popular consumer-facing ones. For instance, the Playboy Mansion game that she did a number of years ago. So she's got a very good input in, and eye on what goes into intellectual property in general. So there are a number of things we'll get into a little more detail about. Uh, she starts off talking about the types of IP, original IP. What's an example of original IP in games? Being done by Games Workshop. They have their own IP that they can then license out to other people or develop internally. Licensed IP. Give us an example of a licensed IP for a game. What's one that would have to be licensed? Star Wars. They'd have to go to Disney and say, let's get that right. You said to go to Lucas. Now it's Disney here. Sequels, and there's another one that I put in that you have to keep be very careful and watch out for, which is contested IP. So the Tolkien estate had a big issue with this for a while, and Marvel has had a big issue with this. In the Tolkien estates, there was one license given to the movies, and then there was another license based on the Lord of the Rings books. So games based on the movies could only include elements from the movies whereas games licensed from the books could include anything out of the books. So the movie folks were licensing games at the same time that the Tolkien estate was licensing games, which made for a very confusing setup and a real pain for the developers working on both of those. Uh, with uh, Marvel, everyone knows about X-Men and uh, Avengers, never the two shall meet in movies due to who owns which licenses and so forth. Though we hope that that's changing. But this is something developers have to be careful about. You'll have in your contracts clauses that say that whoever's licensing these have full rights to license what they say. But you still want to make it sure that there are not other competing licenses that they've given that stop you from doing anything. And this is especially problematic when you have a license from an IP that's being developed in multiple areas. Like if you have a book, if, you have, if there's an overall property Let's say Harry Potter, though. They did a very good job of not messing this up. We'll, we'll pretend they did. You've got Harry Potter, the games, Harry Potter, the books, Harry Potter, the movies, Harry the Potter, the ride, Harry Potter, the merchandise, Harry Potter, the sleeping bags, Harry Potter, the drinking cups, etc., etc. And this becomes problematic if people have the ability to create new elements to the Harry Potter universe. So if I'm selling a line of Harry Potter pajamas and I have the right to create new houses, Suddenly there might be a million fans who want the uh, teddy bear house or something like that. So you would have to be careful to see, A, is there anything else out there you need to be careful about? And B, do you have rights to use that material as well? So for our own Fading Suns universe, we're very careful about this, that anything that we let a licensor make, we can use and anyone else using our license can use as well. So this has to be carefully spelled out. And a lot of licensors are not careful about this. So be aware, if you see other things popping up, what do you have the rights to? Something Brenda doesn't go into here, but is also important, is the idea of an exclusive versus a non-exclusive license. If you have the exclusive game license to Harry Potter, you're the only one who can make the games. However, you might have the exclusive P, uh, PlayStation license, but not the exclusive lace, uh, game license. Someone else might have the exclusive Xbox license, and then you have competing, competing PlayStation and Xbox games. You might have a purely non-exclusive license. I've got the non-exclusive game license to Harry Potter, so someone else probably has a non-exclusive game license at the same time. You're both making games. You want to try not to compete with each other. These things happen. These things happen especially with sports titles and athletes and so forth. And actors will do this. If you have the rights to their use their likeness in a game, you're not the only one who has the rights to use their likeness just for that project. So you need to be careful about how you're portraying them and making sure that you're not having too many conflicts going on with other uh, areas as well. All right, so those are some of the types of IP. One area that I do wish uh, they'd gone into a bit more depth with, because there really is a lot of nuance to these. Don't think you have everything unless you've gone through it completely. So why IP? What's an intellectual property you would like to design a game with? Anybody? Yes? What kind of zombies? Okay. Nazi zombies. Is that a license? Well, yeah, actually, you the rights to the Nazi zombies. They're like sledgehammer and all the other Gotcha. All these people make their own variants. Yeah. Right. 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 The kind of thing that you can do is like, you portray our perspective and teach you. 
All right, that's an interesting license. I would tend to think, yeah, I would do my own Nazi zombies if I uh, wanted to. I would go to the Deadlands folks for their Strange World, for their World War II game, and take theirs if I needed to. Other IP you'd like to work in? Nobody else wants to work in any kind of IP? Yes. Uh, Halo or the uh, anything about Platinum. Okay, why Halo? Why would you want to work in the Halo IP? Well, it's a game. Well, for me, it's a game that got me into gaming. Or okay. serious gaming, and I, uh, it's an engine that I'm very interested in uh, learning and taking apart to learn about it. Okay, excellent. Good reasons. Other games, other IP people would like to work in. Go ahead. To sort out. I've seen an old Houston game I used to have called PsyOps. PsyOps? I've heard of PsyOps. Why PsyOps? Because it was a game that went on by Midway and it was supposed to have a sequel, but the way the picture was became bankrupt after that. Okay. It was actually a game I grew up with, but I would love to actually see the sequel to it. We'll do one more and then we'll analyze these uh, thoughts. Um, probably Bloodborne. Why Bloodborne? Because not only is like the, like the aesthetic really good, of, I really like the aesthetic of it, like the setting of the game world. But you, there's so far there's only one game to come out for it and in the series, and it's only for the PlayStation. So I think I'd really just just so I could get one for like the for like the PC. I think it's it's enough. Like so I like this. Three very different reasons here. One is purely based on that it's the game that inspired him, and he knows he could do something good with Halo. He knows he could do something interesting, and unique with it. Second one is a great business opportunity because something was promised that was never delivered. You have all these fans who are waiting for something that never came out. He can come in and feed that desire. You don't have to build your fan base from scratch. Not only do you have the IP fan base, but you have those folks who have wanted this product all along. And the third one is a similar idea, but slightly different. It's that same inspirational idea of a game, but one where he knows that the fan base's desire for more product has never been fulfilled, and he's got a broad area that he could fill. He wants to do a specific sequel, whereas he can do a much broader area and get these fans on into it. So three very interesting looks at why you'd want to do an IP and all equally legitimate. Inspiration, a specific product that's lacking, or be a specific fan, or three, a specific fan base that's never been really fulfilled. All of those are legitimate. They're artistic and commercial reasons to do it. And there's nothing wrong with any of those. All of those could probably end up having a good game Done. So when you're looking at an IP, there are a lot of reasons that you want to take into account. One of the big ones is, is this a game I actually want to work on? I'm amazed at some of the games people have wanted to work on. I was approached at one point by folks with the Hooters IP. That didn't bother me as much as the folks approached me with the Scientology intellectual, though the L. Ron Hubbard Battlefield Earth intellectual property. So it's the question is, what do you want to work on, and then who do you want to work with? Some licenses are notoriously difficult. We had great times working with uh, uh, the folks at Games Workshop, even though other folks that had more negative experiences. We worked very well with them. Uh, Paramount, when we were doing Star, uh, Star Trek titles, had had a reputation for being difficult to work with, but they'd been working so closely with Interplay for so long that they had ironed out their problems and had become a pretty smooth process by the time we were involved in it. So always interesting to look at the why and then the how will that relationship actually operate. The licensor, whoever that you're paying to have this license, whoever owns the main IP, is going to want some level of approval. What does that mean? It rarely means that they can reject your entire game, but they'll probably have step-by-step -step process, change this, change this, and a certain amount of time which should tell you to make specific changes. So this is when milestones and a design document are very important. That licensor wants to know well in advance what you're planning to do. If, they, if the lawyer has to then get it to the family to approve, and there are like 10 members of the family who own rights to whatever you're doing, everybody needs to have some time to uh, sign off on it. So you'll go through this process, and that process needs to be spelled out all the way along. As a... Uh, they talk about it, the book authors talk about, there's a lot of research to be done to make sure you're including the right elements and make sure you're not offending fans by excluding elements or getting things wrong. This is the first place that you as fans will usually jump on a game designer back when they actually make a mistake. What was 
Uh, pink in the first version is now coming out blue. You know that's wrong, and you'll yell at them forever. This gun is wrong. That name is wrong. That person should never have acted that way. And uh, one area that I really like on how they handle this is dealing with constraints. And this section itself is well worth looking at. What are the constraints you want to consider? What do you want to build out? What is a hard and fast law in the universe? There are some universes, nobody can die. How do you handle that? Or none of the major characters can die. So does that mean if the player is playing Luke Skywalker that that character can never die? How do you handle that as a combat game? Uh, are there types of games that are off limit? Can you do a strategy game but not a first person shooter? That sort of thing. Figure it out and work them out. And uh, the other thing I, I enjoy that they do here is that short bit they have on honor the player. Make sure you are aware of who your core audience is for this game. If it is you, if in this case the Halo player, you know that Halo player, that's a good start. But there are a lot of Halo players who play differently and like different things, so make sure you're keeping them uh, well informed. On the other hand, if you are not particularly a My Little Pony fan and you have the My Little Pony license, you still, you can't be snide and insulting to them. You want to do a game that actually fulfills the reasons they like that intellectual property. If, you're not, if you are a Marvel fan and not a DC fan, but are working on a DC game, honor the DC fans and make sure the game fulfills what they like. Um, we talked a little bit about the approval process. I know in a previous lecture I talked about the interplay issue where they put ducks into space in order to give the uh, licensor something to take out and then they could get other things that were more questionable through. That's never a good idea to do. Uh, you want to have the good working relationship with your licensor. In many cases, the people who own the intellectual property, if they're not the originator of it, they are people who care about it deeply. So you want to make sure that you are treating it respectfully, if for no other reason than the folks who have to give you approval are people who actually do like what they've created. Um, we've seen issues with this in a lot of major properties over the year. Edgar Rice Burroughs' estate had issues over Tarzan movies uh, back when um, the, uh, the Wizard of Oz license was still owned by that, the Baum family. They had always close concern about what were they doing with the movies and so on. But um, the licensor, the person who owns the intellectual property, is benefiting in a number of ways. And you want to keep this in mind. First of all, there's the obvious revenue stream. You're paying them a licensing fee and they're probably getting royalties off of the game that comes out. Secondly, whatever they've already created is suddenly going to get more publicity. Your game comes out and people who maybe never read the books or saw the movie or played with the stuffed animals are suddenly aware of this intellectual property and probably like it. So suddenly the sales of those core areas start to go up. I've seen this in licensing contracts. There's nothing I've ever agreed with or agreed to, but I've seen people include this, that uh, any increase in sales elsewhere, the folks who made the game or the TV show or whatever, would suddenly get a cut of that. When uh, we, we did the vampire game, uh, Aaron Spelling did a TV show based on it. And the original contract that we were presented with was said that any increase in our game sales, Aaron Spelling would get a percentage of. Some legitimacy is putting a lot more eyes on it, but certainly we can't control for the fact that all these new sales would be coming from Aaron Spelling. Obviously, we're doing a lot of other things ourselves, so no reason to give that licensee that cut of the money. Yes? Okay, you said you kind of regret re 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 it giving them the option, like giving them the IP to actually, you know, work on it. Okay, you never thought it would have been as successful, it been as successful as it is now. So right. Well, that that is so. Um, we've talked before about um, uh, the company that was doing Robotech that had the Kickstarter that didn't do well, Palladium. So they had made their big success in the game industry by licensing Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles before the TV show, when it was just a comic book. And that game, as soon as that TV show exploded and did so well, suddenly that role-playing game was very popular and made a lot of money accordingly. 
uh, Eastman and Laird never begrudged him any of that money. I know they were quite happy still to have that out there, a very low comparative royalty cost, something he couldn't have gotten if uh, the TV show had come first. But uh, not all license holders are that way. You'll see a lot of them trying to renegotiate if suddenly the uh, IP becomes a lot more popular than folks initially uh, imagined. That's why you want to have that close relationship with the intellectual property holders so they don't try and pull things away from you. Not all intellectual property will necessarily make good games or not all intellectual property holders will be good people to work with. So there are a lot of reasons to go into it carefully, but there are also a lot of reasons to try and make it work well once you're in that relationship. The Star, Star Trek games I worked on made a lot of money for everybody involved. So, uh, well, less for me, but for everybody else involved, they made a lot of money. And I do get to go around saying that I was part of the team that wrote the last lines of dialogue, Shatner has delivered his Kirk, which is a fun bit of thing to be able to say. And it was fun stuff to work on. But uh, keep in mind what you're creating, why you're creating it, and what the end result should be. And one thing that I've always been happy about is that most intellectual property owners are very happy to have game designers think outside the box to continue to talk about the universe. I'll use the Palladium example. They did their role-playing game based on uh, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, and they really expanded the universe. They had a lot of creatures and uh, events and the like that Eastman and Laird never dealt with. Eastman and Laird didn't include it down the line, but they enjoyed the things that came out of it and thought it was pretty fun. Uh, on the other hand, we're seeing in Star Wars a lot of concern right now about things that used to be considered official parts of the universe being changed around. Are they official parts of the universe? Are they not? What really came from before does matter. Friends of mine who wrote novels in that universe are now not sure if their novels are what, are what is called canon or not. And this is something you as a game designer want to be sure of. If there is an extensive intellectual property with lots of materials out there, what is considered official and what is not? There's been a lot of, diverse, uh, of divergence within the Star Trek universe. So they, Paramount has what is basically the Star Trek Bible. This is considered official. These are the text schematics of the Enterprise. This is exactly how Starfleet works, etc. And this is how, what you have to follow. And these are the areas where you can start making things up. And that's the more and more limited area over time. All right. Any, uh, any questions about the Chapter 9 part of intellectual property? Before we jump on into chapter 10, talking more about sequels. So how many of you like sequels? All right, how many of you don't like sequels? Yeah, I think all of us know some sequels that are good to play. I'm not even sure what version of Civilization they're up to now, but all the versions of Civilization have been a lot of fun. I'm not sure what Age of Empires is up to. Those have all been fun along the way. Um, but uh, they have a nice breakdown in here of why make a sequel. You want to do something better, you've got an existing fan base, you've got ideas. If you worked on the original game, you have a ton of ideas that you couldn't incorporate in that first game. You want to incorporate into a future game. One of the, I've done a number of sequels for my own games over the years. And one of the core things you always want to keep in mind is, what did we do in the first? What do the players want to see in the second? What do they deserve to see? And what can we afford to actually bring into reality? And this is one of the biggest problems I see game developers having with sequels. The players played the first game, loved it. Their memories of the first game are already more elaborate than what was really in there. And their desire for the sequel is limitless. So what can you actually afford to bring into creation becomes one of your main limiting Issues. This is, again, one of those areas where it becomes good to focus on not making everything incredible, but focus on one, two, three specific things that you, can do, you know you can do significantly better and excite the fans again. The best sequels reignite the fan base, bring in new fans, and get them all inspired in all new ways while keeping the core elements in place. The worst sequels just repeat what happened before, burn out the existing fans, do little to attract new fans, and do almost nothing to inspire anyone to make a third version of it. So your goal, if you're working on a sequel, is to figure out how to reinvigorate it, re-inspire, 
do new things while being true to the original game. Uh, I love uh, Halo games where you've got a strategy game as opposed to just a first-person shooter. Mech games where you've got a strategy game or the classic first-person perspective mech game. Games that take a different look at it. That's, uh, my own company is essentially based on this idea, the holistic design. We take a holistic approach. We can take a look at your game in any number of ways. Our, our Fading Suns universe, we have a grand strategy game where you're the emperor. You have massive control of everything. You've got a paper role-playing game where you're one individual fighting it out and all this with very little power. New Noble Armada game, you're kind of intermediate. Taking all these different perspectives on it to illuminate a different part of the uh, of those of the of the intellectual property. So our games bring new eyes to your world, and the idea being that we can not only attract new audiences but have them look at it in different ways, and have the old audiences look at it in different ways than they have before. Uh, so then uh, they break down into a number of the different types of sequels, expansion packs, mods, sequels, yearly releases like you have with Madden and the sports games, spiritual successors we talked about before, uh, the clones make it just like that with something a little different. Um, I would say it's interesting that we consider expansion packs sequels. Often the idea is to have play it in conjunction with the rest of it. But in many ways, it's true. It's a sequel to the events that happened in the previous iteration of the game. All right. Uh, one thing that I was very amused by within the uh, Brathway Schreiber book was how they used the 4X rules to apply to sequels. So who remembers what the 4Xs are? Exploration. That's the last one, exterminate. Expansion, exploit, that's right. So in a strategy game, you explore the universe, get rid of the fog of war, you expand your control over resources, you exploit those resources to give you whatever you need to win the game, and then you win the game, exterminate the enemy, crush their companies, whatever. Uh, I love how they set it up here. Exploit, know what made the original game good and don't screw it up. Expand, improve upon many features of the game, checking each to make sure that it still strengthens the core of the game in some way. Explore, survey the genre overall as compared to your game, and try to innovate in some way, be it an online feature or a new play mode such as co-op. Exterminate, if there are features that make the game's core weaker or detract from features that make the game core stronger, remove them. If your players hate it, it's a safe bet it should go, too. I love that breakdown. I hadn't seen that one before until I read this book. And... Uh, enjoyed that look at well worth keeping in mind honestly not just for sequels but for any game that you're doing but I love how they phrased it there for uh, for sequels okay that's a quick look at intellectual property and sequels there are in the KSU business school I'm sure entire classes on intellectual property there certainly are law schools but uh, we will consider an hour and a half talking about it I guess a, one hour talking about it to be enough for now. Any questions before we go to a break? <laughs> you are correct. Uh, 7.20, come back at 7.30, and we will talk about Planescape. For those of you who read the Planescape CRPG design doc, let's talk about it in terms of the license. It's based on the Dungeons and Dragons license. What do they consider the important things to take out of Dungeons and Dragons for this game? What are the things that show up as important to them? What do they consider things to be avoided? What do they want to make different from the Dungeons and Dragons game? They want to make it more gory, more horrific, more emotionally uh, impactful, I think is a better way to phrase it. Um, what is uh, was an example of that? Uh, inflict pain in ways you won't believe, spells that make you pity the target. 
So fireball is a popular Dungeons and Dragons spell. They're not going to uh, fireball is an elementary school spell as far as they're concerned. Uh, equip stuff that would scare small children. Be much more powerful than you would be in a standard Dungeons and Dragons game. Don't start at first level. Start with certain amounts of power. What are they uh, taking from the Dungeons and Dragons universe that they're building on? The Planescape setting, which was uh, one of the Dungeons and Dragons setting itself. Obviously the monsters. The idea of the undead. Uh, all of those uh, being a part of it. Um, the character growth and advancement that Dungeons and Dragons offers, even if you're going to uh, higher uh, limits with it. One of the interesting things that they say is they want to do, they want to push the TSR ethics code. TSR was the company that owned Dungeons and Dragons at that time. That's before Wizards of the Coast bought, Wizards of the Coast bought uh, TSR and then Hasbro bought Wizards of the Coast. It's very interesting because the uh, TSR basic ethics code was very interesting amalgamation of ideas. So they had rules against male or female characters being dressed provocatively unless they were quote unquote of heroic proportions, which was their way of doing the Frank Frazetta, big Conan, uh, Red Sonia characters, very muscular, big, yet still scantily clad characters. And, allow it for them and not for other folks. Because one of the interesting things about TSR is not only did the rules apply for their games, they used to run the biggest paper gaming convention, Gen Con, and those same rules applied to anything that anyone wanted to sell there. My own company ran into issues with that with our vampire game where we would have to argue with them over different interpretations of their own uh, in-house rules in order to sell products at, uh, at Gen Con over the years. But what I think that this design doc does well, there's some issues with it. Uh, there are areas where I think that um, uh, the TSR ethics code actually won out for the better. They talk about this being, uh, I don't know, what was it, babes, 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 or something like that. And I don't remember the game being nearly as focused that way as in reality than it was in their design doc. I think there are some places where the License had a good calming influence on them and other areas where they really took the license and ran with it and did a lot of, a lot of innovative things. The combat system, the powers, the spells. And most excitingly within the game was the interaction within your own party. You'd have a party you would build up. You'd have your one main character that you'd play and then other party members who would adventure with you. And there'd be constant interaction between you and those characters. And that... Different characters would stay with you based on whether you acted honorably or not. You would attract the more evil characters if you acted more dishonorably, for instance. And those characters and their interaction was really what people commented on in the long run in this game. They showed this one skull character who was with you from the beginning, and that was a very interesting part of the game all the way through. So, I don't think that this design doc was necessarily made to be an external document. Uh, there's a lot of things in here that make it appear to me that it's for the team to keep the team on track with what they want to create. Most notably being there are spoilers in this document. If you haven't played Planescape and you read through this, you have some a lot of knowledge leading up to the end of this game. This is not a document they wanted outside of their studio well beforehand. I'm not even sure this is a document they wanted in TSR's hands while they were developing the game. I have a feeling this was only meant to be uh, at Bioware slash Interplay during that time. Um, but uh, there's a lot of things like this where they want the team to be on the same page. They want the character to be, the puzzle about the character to be the interesting part of the game. Why they died, who did it, etc. Making that a fun part of it. Oh, there's the total babes thing. This game will have lots of babes that make the player go, wow, there will be Finnish babes, human babes, angelic babes, Asian babes, even unbabed babes. And we'll all regrettably behave within the TSR code of ethics. I don't remember that being anywhere near that 
omnipresent as that line would have you believe. So I have a feeling the TSR did step down on that. Not in my experience, but uh, it, is, uh, it is a bunch of odd phrasing, so, and I don't think it made its way in in the end. It certainly didn't come across that way. It certainly wasn't an end more babes game. Uh, and this is an interesting part of it. This is what I, one of the things that I liked about it, and you should consider. It doesn't stop with the game. So the idea is being an immersive introduction of Planescape. So for those of you who have played Dungeons and Dragons, you're aware that you have the core game, but then you have these various settings. Ravenloft, Forgotten Realms, uh, Neverwinter Nights, etc. And Planescape is one of those. It's kind of like where all these different settings converge and a whole bunch more. So you're visiting all these different planes where weird things are happening and different rules of existence and different laws of physics and so forth apply. And that's what I like about what they di did here. They want to take the feel of what TSR had created with Planescape, build on it, make it even better, but also excite players even more about it. You leave Planescape and you want to go play a version of the tabletop game. And for the uh, Last Rites team, you want to play a sequel to this game as well. So they're trying to enrich the entire intellectual property by making this game. By doing this game, they want to excite people about playing more of their computer games. They want to excite people about playing more of TSR's tabletop games in order that they feed each other. They support each other down the line. This sort of team vision statement is something I would strongly encourage. So take a very close look at this. This is what they want the game to create. Don't do what's done before. This is Planescape, not high fantasy. It's not Tolkien. It is a very gritty setting with all sorts of weird things. Not the elegance, so elegance is there. It's a spiky and jagged world. It's not feudal farmstead. You feel like any house you walk into might kill you. Filled with jagged and spiky people, anyone could be a threat. Re-examine your first instinct. Love this idea. This is something we talk about in game jams. Come up with your first idea. Look at it, love it, and then throw it out and do something else. Because everybody else has had that same first idea. Dig deeper, come up with more interesting ways to handle things. And then finally, go nutty. If you're not excited about an idea, make it exciting. Make it different. Make it crazy. Add weird things to it. Not all games should have this vision statement. But it is a good idea for games to have a team vision statement that everybody could look at and understand. This vision statement is as applicable to the programmers as it is to the artists, as it is to the designers, and even to the marketing team. Not necessarily as applicable to the QA team. You don't want them to go nutty with the QA. You want them to do a very detailed and analytical QA for this game, because the game's going to be weird anyway. But uh, for everybody else, keep this in mind. And it's very important for marketing to understand that it's a spiky and jagged world filled with jagged and spiky people. That it's not high fantasy, it's not Tolkien. They don't already know that coming into it. All right. Those were the main areas I wanted you to look at. I like the art Bible, a fairly nice look at different characters. You'll notice there's one thing that I both like and don't like about this art Bible, and that is all the different types of artwork in here. So you've seen these uh, pen and ink sketches, and then bam, full color, basically rendered look. The skeleton looks very different from the folks come before. The main character looks like it, he's a different art style than the other ones. One thing I like an art Bible to do is have a very consistent style so new artists who come into the program know what they need to be doing. It's not high fantasy. This is a very spiky, jagged person. That's kind of the uh, example. Of it. But this is not anime. This is not high fantasy. This is not ultra-realistic. This is not cartoony. This is a distinctive horror fantasy sort of look. Uh, I'm not necessarily sure that all the others fulfill that as well. So that, for instance, obviously is them going nutty with the ideas. And that, I guess, is the epitome of a spiky, jagged person because he has both spikes and jagged parts. Even though he's not a person. Uh, so... 
that's uh, there's some beautiful piece of artwork here. I don't like this as an art bible because it really doesn't define the art style as well as spiky and jagged does. I would like to see more talk about the types of armor, weapons, people, spells, special effects, etc. Uh, and they have all these different uh, enemies and again <coughs> a variety of different styles. This bullet points issue is something that you would want to really put in marketing hands, maybe TSR's hands. So this is one thing I like that I won't necessarily push to have in a design document, but it's useful to have there. Good information for marketing. What are the selling points of your games? You do need your selling points, your competitive advantage. Maybe not out to this uh, depth. First computer game set in TSR's Planescape setting. Interplay is the only company to ever have this license. 40 different creatures, 20 quality spells, 70 plus weapons. You can just see that on the box cover right now. And I think some of that already was. Wep armor you can customize. non tileable settings. Shadow and colored lighting effects. Motion capture characters. Play characters immortal. Has powers no other characters ever had. Etc. Etc. So that is something you feel that they did just to plop into marketing's hands and also into uh, into TSR's hands. And then this whole goal of the game part at the end, obviously there to give the whole team the walkthrough and let them know what they need to do about level creation. All right. So all in all, actually. Despite some minor grievances with the doc, I think it's a very good look at how to do a design doc based on an intellectual property. It's a very honest look at how to do it. So if you ever have to do one, well worth pulling this out of your back pocket and examining uh, what they did. And you get to see all their town layouts and the like, and the rest of it is pretty much level, level, setting, story, etc. You don't start out at first level. This is what differentiates it from normal ADD. Your actions define the character, not what character class you choose, etc. All right, any thoughts or questions about Planescape? Okay. Let's go ahead and talk about a very different game, Shoots and Ladders. Not exactly a licensed product. However, because you're now getting into your game dev side, I thought it was time to talk about actual ways to analyze your game and this is the first very good way to break it down when you're looking at your own game you want to start looking at the math behind it we've already talked uh, very briefly about probabilities we've talked about different dice types different results you get from dice different results you get from cards etc and now he's showing you this one thing you'll find in the industry is there's a lot of mathematical analysis of the games we create. How many different combinations are there? How many different combinations of characters and weapons and armor and planescape? They break that all out. Folks in the metrics handle it. So this is a look at a very simple game and the math is essentially pretty simple but uh, I don't know if everyone followed as easy. Matrix math, I don't know how many of you have actually had a good exposure to that here or in high school. But being able to break down how many moves does this take, it means you suddenly know how much time this game will take to play on the high end and on the low end. They talk a little bit about other ways to use this. When you're figuring out damage in a game, are weapons you're putting in too powerful? Are they too weak? Is the armor too powerful? Is it too weak? This is how you calculate that. Are we doing enough damage? Are we giving characters enough experience to get them to the level they want to be in enough time? Do the cars go fast enough uh, in the game relative to the player's other actions? Economy is a big one for this. Is the player able to generate enough money to make good choices, but not so much that they can don't have any choice made? They basically buy everything, which is a problem in too many games. These are the algorithms you use to figure that out. So they talk about two different ways to handle this. One was the Monte Carlo simulation where you actually roll all the dice all the way you need to roll them and figure out where it comes. You just set up a computer model of the game and let it go and see what happens. Uh, we actually do this in testing games. If you have AI, you have the AI play every roll and you see what happens and see what comes out. Just get the game running, see where it breaks, see what works, see what strategies they, they follow along the way. 
um, this is becoming more and more important in a lot of other areas as well. Uh, stock model, mo uh, stock market models are handled this way. Every major investment company now has their own stock market, essentially game, running constantly on their computers to try and predict where the market's going and make their trades based on it, based on other algorithms as well. So that's one way to do it. You've got a game. You do all the dice rolls. What happens if all the dice rolls are made? What's the effect of it? How long does it take? What happens? Can anyone actually win the game? And so forth. And then the much quicker but somewhat more complex Markov chain analysis. And this is what you'll see folks in the industry doing a variant of on a fairly regular basis. And especially like I talk about when you're figuring damage to hit chances and so forth. Uh, and this is where you are creating this matrix of all the different results and seeing what, where your mean, median, and uh, mode start to lie. So who's familiar with the terms median, mode, and mean? All right, who wants to try explaining those? So whenever you use the term average, you have to then explain what you mean by average. The average all right, so then the average is basically like, based on all the numbers that are presented, it's about the middle, it's not exactly There you go. There you go. So 50% of the numbers will be above it, 50% of the numbers will be below it. The uh, median's in the middle. Very good. I forgot what exactly uh, mean was. No. Someone else want to jump on mean? Someone else want to be mean? Again, what do you mean by average? Yeah, like Add them all up and divide them by the number. Yeah. yeah, okay. You have to be careful using the term average because the whole idea of probabilities is average only means what you define it to mean. Yeah. And what's mode? I remember mode. Mode is the number shows up the most. Yeah. There you go. Yeah. So is the number that shows up the most the average? Is the one that's in the middle of them all the average? Is the one that happens when you add them all up and divide them out the average? Average is essentially a meaningless term when you're talking about statistics like this. So be very careful saying average. An average person is very unaverage in their own mind. All right, but being able to set up that sort of matrix and get that breakdown lets you know very quickly if the, uh, the numbers that you're plugging into the game are the ones you want to have in the game. Say you have resource production. How fast do you want things coming back? Uh, how often is there new... We do something like this for the mall tycoon game. How often are shoppers in there? How much are they buying? How much do they spend in the mall? What impact does that have? And then what does, can the player be buying with it? We do these breakdowns on the economic side of it. So having this in your back pocket is a very useful analytical tool for any level of design that you are doing, and for a lot of the different areas. Um, there is our websites that will define this in more detail and kind of walk you through it. There are some really good YouTube tutorials on doing this sort of math. Uh, if you are going to be part of a team that is doing any sort of metrics tracking, and almost every serious game dev team now tracks metrics within the game, this is the basis for a significant part of what you'll be working on. So take a look at it, and if you get a chance to do another math class where they address this, not a bad idea. I really would like to see probabilities be a core part of the uh, game design program, and this should be in there as well, working with matrices in general. I mean, working with matrices is a key part of coding in any case, but very useful for game devs. All right. So you saw the breakdown of how they handle it and a little bit of the variance between the two modes, Monte Carlo and Marco. Does anyone have any specific questions about this for me to address? Again, take a look at it. Take a look at YouTube videos on this to get a better look at it and be ready to apply it to your own titles. All right, so the rest of the class, we're going to be working in teams, and I'm going to be giving you some new assignments. So go ahead and get in your team. If you do not have a team, please come over to the pit fighter machine that is really not a pit fighter machine. Team for the challenge six, get in your team.
Okay, where is Team Humpty Dumpty Prison Break 2? Team Back to the Crack. Have you worked, all the people on that team, raise your hand. Have you worked with those people before? Have you worked with any of those people before? We have one person in the team, you have. You worked with one, okay. Um, let's see. Team Cheeks Production, raise your hand. Have you worked with any of them before? You now have a new team member who's been hired. <laughs> All right, everyone in their group. All right, guess what? There is an investor interested in your studio. But your investor wants to see some more things from you before they're going to put money into it. First of all, they want you to have a studio name. If you haven't already got a studio name, you have to do one. Add it to your discussion thread. You're going to need to come up with a studio logo. Yes, I know you're not artists. You can still do a logo. You will need to submit business cards with your logo and your title. As part of it. Anything else you want to put on the business card, that's up to you. The very basics are studio name, logo, and your name and your title. So you all now have titles. I don't know what your titles are, but come up with them. Uh, for your board game, you need to come up with an elevator pitch. We've been talking about it. A one. Three cents max, preferably one or two sentences. What makes your game unique and makes me want to give you money for it? You are going to also come up with your primary social media focus for this. Is it going to be the Facebook group? Is it going to be Instagram postings? Is it going to be a Twitter campaign? Something else? We do need to come up with hashtags for it. So for instance, no more mana, hashtag no more mana, hashtag uh, lost world, hashtag RTF, hashtag fading sun. So I want at least four hashtags that you'd be using to promote your game. You can even just use like screenshot Fridays because your art would be that good. You're going to show it off every Friday. And on the design doc that you are doing of the digital game, each one individually is doing. This last one is not a team part, it's an individual part. I want you to include your primary sales platform, Steam, Apple Store, Play Store, Itch.io, um, the PS uh, uh, Library, whatever, and why that would be the best platform for your game. And I will go ahead and do the last thing. I've been debating it, but I think it'll be a good one for everybody here to do. You knew it was coming after I talked about it in Planescape. Yes, yes, the vision statements. I want three things about your game that everybody should know and that make it unique. So you can refer back to Planescape. They do more than that. They do one, two, three, four, five, six. You only need to do three. But a vision, a team vision statement about your game. What, what makes it interesting, what makes it unique, and what should everybody working on the game keep in mind? All right, any questions about that? And that's for that last one. The vision statement is for the team, for the board game. Only the sales platform is for your design up. Everything else is for the team project. Any 
And if you have a fifth member, feel free to assign them some of those last tasks. Yes, question. A prototype of the board game is due for playtesting in class next Wednesday. It is not due to be turned in for a grade then. You're going to be incorporating the playtest feedback to make a better game. So you're not done with the board game next week. Any other questions? All right, get to work.